Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I would like to continue the sermon from last week, which was concerning Sunday observance. <clears throat> the law of the church requires us to assist at Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. It is binding on all who have achieved the use of reason, or have the use of reason. It requires us to assist both in body and in mind. So first we'll talk about the bodily presence that's necessary. This presence requires us to be either physically in the church where mass is taking place or to be morally present in it. For moral presence, it is sufficient that we either see or hear the celebrant during the principal parts of the mass or that we are able to distinguish the parts of the Mass by the sound of the bells or by the singing of the choir or any other indication. It's not even necessary that we be inside the church for this. So if there were a great crowd and you could not get into the church, you are still assisting at Mass if you hear it and you hear the various parts of the Mass. Or you could be in the basement of a church hearing what is going on upstairs, you are still celebrating, uh, still assisting at Mass. Now, what are the principal parts of the Mass? They are the offertory, the canon, and the communion of the priest. We are required under pain of mortal sin, according to the law of the church, to, ad to assist at least at those three parts, to omit the other parts is a venial sin. So it is a venial sin to arrive late for Mass or to leave early if we are leaving before the offertory, or excuse me, arriving before the offertory or leaving after the communion of the priest. So that's considered a venial sin to omit those parts. However, that doesn't mean that it's good or that you should do it. It's an irreverence to God, and that's why it's a venial sin. And venial sins, as all of the spiritual authors say, lead to mortal sins. Now, I have to say this. There are a good many people in this parish who arrive habitually every Sunday late for Mass. And that is something that you must correct you should arrive in plenty of time for Mass. And also you should have all of your children into the bathroom facilities before they come into the church. So many times there's a hold up there because the children have to use the bathroom. That should all be done long before Mass. Also I notice that often children are permitted to leave Mass during even the principal parts for the reason of using the bathroom, or I might say the pretext of using the bathroom. Now, many times they get bored, and because we live in a child-centric world, whatever the child wants, the child does. It is possible that there's a legitimate need for it, but as I said, those legitimate needs should be taken care of before Mass. When I was a child, I did not know that there was a bathroom in our church. I discovered that years later because we were not allowed to leave in order to use the bathroom. The only excuse for going out of mass was to vomit. And so you had to be there for mass. So that's important to inculcate in your children the necessity to be there for Mass. We also must assist in mind, and this consists both in exterior attention and interior attention. Exterior attention means that we do nothing which is incompatible with the religious action which we must perform. Example looking around, writing, drawing, reading books other than devotional books, 
And that would include even reading the lives of the saints because they are historical, they're not devotional. Or to concentrate our thoughts on worldly things such as business, for example. Or to look on our iPads and look at the news on on your iPad or something similar. There's so many ways to be distracted today. To do these things deliberately is to mock Almighty God. To come to Mass and to be deliberately distracted is to mock Almighty God. Interior attention consists first in having at least the implicit intention of hearing Mass. So if you get dressed and say we have to go to Mass today with the idea that we're fulfilling our obligation and doing, doing what we should do, that's sufficient. That's an implicit intention, we call that. It's a very real intention, but it's implicit. However, I'll give you an example of someone who does not have the implicit intention, a young man who goes to church only for the reason for seeing a girl that he's interested in. That is not a sufficient intention for attending Mass. And he doesn't truly assist at Mass. Secondly, we have to fix our mind and word, uh, excuse me, our mind on the words or actions of the celebrant or on the Mass itself, on God, any pious thought through prayer and meditation. Your principal participation in the Mass is mental and devotional. You have to understand that in Catholic theology, it is the priest who is the principal agent of the Mass. He is the one that, that offers the Mass. You offer your sacrifice to God through the action of the priest. You cannot offer any sacrifice to God without the action of the priest. And any personal sacrifice that you may offer to God has value only through the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice that is performed on the altar. So the Catholic religion is sacerdotal, meaning that it is, it, it, it is priestly. The action of the priest is all important. In the Protestant religion, the, it is the congregation that is the principal agent of the worship. And so they sing hymns and do other things. And the Protestant minister is merely there to guide them in their own act of worship. This is also the idea of the Novus Ordo. They call the priest the president of the assembly and they believe in congregational worship and that everybody is in a way a priest and offers the mass in that way and that the priest at the altar is merely helping you and presiding over the whole assembly. It's Protestant, it's not Catholic. Right, so you have to understand that you're, the way in which you offer the mass is primarily mentally by devotion and by union with what the priest is doing at the altar. That is why the una cum mass, the mass in which Bergoglio is mentioned during the canon, is very offensive to God because you are doing exactly what the priest is doing. If he is in union with the heretics who have destroyed our religion, then you are too, if you're actively assisting at that mass. <clears throat> so someone who would go to sleep during the mass does not have the required attention, obviously. Now, someone might doze off without wanting to, but if you just decide I'm going to sleep through this whole thing, then you, ha- you don't have the right intention. attention. excuse me. And reading a devotional book is a good way. Uh, the Father Lassant's prayer books, for example, are wonderful. 
but you should not read a life of a saint. And the recitation of the rosary is another very good thing to do. Following in the Missal is a wonderful way to participate in the Mass. But really, any devotional prayer is good. It is also legitimate to confess on Sunday. Moral theologians say it is legitimate to have confessions on Sunday, but there should be no confessions heard during the consecration. And that's why you see the sign back there. Also, there should be a necessity involved uh, and that's why we confine the Sunday confessions only to those who are outside of Hernando County, which are quite a few people. Now, what are the causes which dispense from hearing mass? First, physical impossibility, such as the sick, those who are truly sick, prisoners, military personnel, and travelers who have no mass to attend. Now, many people ask the priest, well, you know, I have to go away on business or we're going on vacation. Uh, do, I, do I sin by missing mass? Am I obliged to always be close to a mass uh, on those days? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the, it used to be that every city in the whole world had mass to go to. Now the, the masses that are available to you are few and far between. And it does not offend God that if you are traveling for some legitimate reason, even vacation, and you don't have a mass, uh, uh, you cannot go. So there is a general moral principle, and that is you can't miss mass unless you have a mass to miss. So always remember that. Do I have a mass to miss? If the answer is no, then don't worry. Also for travel, if you are more than one hour's travel time from a mass, you are not obliged to go. So that is whatever travel time is available to you, whether it's public transportation, whether it's your car, whether it's even walking. If it's an hour's travel time, you're not obliged. Then there is moral impossibility. For example, those who are weak, or convalescent, perhaps you're, you've had an operation uh, and you just need to stay in for a number of Sundays, that's perfectly normal. Uh, also, uh, you might have difficulty in traveling due to inclement weather, such as snow and ice. Obviously, you can't claim that in Florida, but in other parts of the country you could, uh, and that might vary from uh, person to person in the sense that a young person might brave a few inches of snow uh, without any trouble, but an older person might legitimately fear getting stuck in the snow and having serious problems as a result. So your, your condition and your age uh, would have a lot to say about that. Uh, or in Florida, for example, very heavy rain, which might occur, uh, that would be also a case for an older person who may not see very well, and, and uh, could have easily an accident. That would be a, a reason to stay home. Or uh, if you have necessity to work on Sunday. Now I said last week you should avoid uh, with, every, uh, with everything possible in you to have a job that makes you work on Sunday. But more and more these jobs are inevitable and in order to support yourself you must take these jobs. Uh, if so, you are dispensed from hearing mass. Uh, or you are dispensed if by hearing Mass you might endure a great loss or miss a great profit. So a farmer who has to uh, do his harvest on a few certain days, as I said last week uh, uh, in California, they must pick the grapes over a period of three or four days. That would be legitimate on those days to miss Mass. Uh, or if you don't have the suitable attire for mass, you're dispensed. This often happens when your luggage doesn't follow you on an airplane. And so you arrive in jeans and some other, we might call, we might call it grubby attire that you've been flying around in. You can't go to mass the next day uh, or uh, if you don't have the proper clothing, you should just stay home. <clears throat> 
or those who are con uh, confined to their house for reason of shame. For example, if they have some bad reputation in a community and they, people would look at them and, and, and speak about them, uh, they, they are dispensed from going to Mass or those who are prevented by others from attending Mass, particularly the elderly, if they're living among their children who are pagans and will not take them to Mass, they are dispensed, or children who may not be able to get to Mass. Sometimes young people convert to the faith, but their parents will not take them to Mass. That happens. There are other excuses arising from charity, such as care of the sick or elderly, that's uh, very common. If you cannot leave somebody alone for a long period of time, you are dispensed. And as a matter of fact, your obligation would be to stay with the sick or elderly in that case. Or those who must assist a neighbor who is in great, who's had a, gr a great calamity, such as a fire or a flood. That obligation of charity dispenses you from the obligation of Sunday. There is always, there's a general principle that you can exchange and even should exchange works of piety for works of charity. That is where charity demands, the, the works of piety cede to the obligations of charity. And uh, you could also stay home and should stay home if by your presence you would prevent a serious harm or wrong. Let's say perhaps that children are being some way abused by a member of the family, and if you were not there, it would happen, then you should stay home. So what do you do if you have no mass and cannot go to mass? It is recommended, but it is not the law. It is recommended that you make up for it by prayer and works of piety although there is no obligation to do this. So what would be very laudable is to say the rosary, to uh, read spiritual books, and do other uh, uh, pious things or charitable things. Uh, these, this would be a, a way in which to, um, uh, to fulfill the, the Sunday obligation. Now, outside of that, there are some counseled works. These are not works that are according to the law of the church. They are not obliged. They do not oblige according to the law, but none, nonetheless they're counseled. Uh, among them is assisting at vespers and or benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. We have gotten away from the idea of sanctifying the whole Sunday. The the Again, when I was growing up in the 1950s, the typical Sunday was the uh, mass in the morning, then a midday meal, which was very festive, then typically some visiting in the afternoon, and then you would go to benediction at five o'clock. So that the, 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 the day was, was uh, observed piously, both at the beginning and at the end. Uh, it's not obligatory, but I was told by an el elderly priest in France years ago that before World War II, that the faithful had commonly so much piety that they would go to Vespers and Benediction in the afternoon with the same devotion and feeling of obligation as they went to Mass that they wouldn't miss Vespers and Benediction any more than they would miss Mass, even though there was no obligation at all to go to Vespers and Benediction. Now, many of you live at distances, you can't do this, but I'm just pointing out that the whole day is the Lord's Day, 24 hours. There is a, uh, something that, that is in all of us, is a tendency to spiritual laziness, which is this, to do the minimum piety possible. See, to get mass over with early in the morning. The shorter the mass, the better. 
If the priest gives a short sermon, wonderful. If he gives no sermon at all, that's better. Because we get out sooner, we get to breakfast, we get to talking, we get to our leisure, our pleasure, rest, anything else we're doing. Years ago, I had laryngitis. And I put on the, the door of the chapel that there would be no sermon today because I couldn't give it. And one of the parishioners said afterwards, that was the only time that I came away from mass feeling good about myself. So the, the, that, that spirit of spiritual laziness is a tendency in all of us. It leads to materialism, it leads to worldliness. Whereas in fact, the most important things you do are your works of piety, and the most important of those is your assistance at Mass. Those are the valuable things of your life because you're all going to die. And after your death, you're going to be judged. And you're going to lead a life either of happiness or of misery after you die. And you will be judged according to your works. And what pertains most to your life of happiness after death is what you are doing here today, right now. Not your works of leisure, pleasure, eating, talking, sports. Although those things are perfectly legitimate in themselves, they will pass away with time. You forget about them as they go. You can't remember what you've been doing the past few weeks. It, these acts of piety, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and all of your other acts of piety, particularly the rosary, contribute to your eternal happiness. They keep you on track. They keep you in the state of grace. Whereas spiritual laziness is going to drag you down into mortal sin, almost certainly. And the more you are lazy, the worse it gets. So remember, Sunday is the Lord's Day all day. Another recommended thing to do is to read works of devotion, particularly the lives of the saints. Or to do works of charity, such as visiting the sick or the elderly, helping the poor. Those are all recommended. And we should avoid any entertainments which are significantly distracting. For example, major sporting events. In the past, these things were avoided on Sunday. They were not even done on Sunday. But the culture is godless. The culture wants to make Sunday a great weekend day. And if there is any religion, it is gotten over with early in the morning. And the rest of the day is given over to typically sports, sitting in front of a television set and watching a football game or a baseball game. That is not within the spirit of Sunday. That is a major distraction. Or to go to one of those games is a major distraction if you read the older books, it will say major sporting events are violations of Sunday. That means they should not even be held. Uh, but uh, so the, the, that's something to avoid. Uh, it's an act of piety and reverence to God to avoid those things on Sunday. What we might call backyard sports are fine. Just personal entertainment sports. Those are fine. But to be all mentally involved in a big sporting game uh, is, is not in the spirit of Sunday. For example, going to a gambling casino on Sunday. I don't think anyone with common sense would, would say that passing your time at a gambling casino on Sunday is a good way to spend Sunday. It is not specifically against the law. But that's such a worldly place and such a distracting place that it is not for, 
for people, a place for people to spend Sunday. In fact, you shouldn't be in it at any time, as far as I'm concerned. St. Louis, the King of France, shut everything down in the kingdom. All the gambling was shut down during his reign. And he told his son, don't permit it. It's in his testament. No gambling in the kingdom. So that's something that should be totally uh, avoided. The idea of betting and, and playing games of that nature is not wrong in itself, but it's the whole atmosphere and the, the distraction of it which becomes wrong and the possibility of addiction to it and the wasting of money. That's where it becomes wrong. Similarly, to spend your time in a bar on Sunday is obviously not in the spirit of this holy day. There's nothing wrong with sitting at a table and having someone bring you an alcoholic drink and you pay him money for it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that on a Sunday. But the atmosphere of a bar is worldly and dirty. And it's a place that really we should never be in, but particularly on Sundays. Or worldly shows, worldly dancing, anything that's worldly. This world, it's a day to think about the next world. I also would bring to your attention Thanksgiving after Mass. It is not the law that you have to make a Thanksgiving after Mass. Now after the bishop's Mass, you notice that the bishop kneels down and actually reads his Thanksgiving prayers. That's part of his low mass, is to make a preparation and also to make a Thanksgiving. So if you come to the bishop's mass, it's part of the mass. But most of the time the bishop is not saying the mass. So stay a few minutes. If you have your missiles, you'll find Thanksgiving prayers after the canon, in almost all missiles. Say some prayers after mass. I compare it to this. Suppose you went to someone's house, a rich man's house, and he put on a splendid meal for you, and you eat it. And then when dessert is done and the coffee is over, you get up and run out. You don't say a word. Just put your napkin down and run out the door. That would be so impolite you would never be invited back. Remember what was said in last week's bulletin, a beautiful quote from St. Augustine, that the omnipotence of God, the God who created the whole universe, all of the power of all of those planets and stars, all of the intense power and immensity, the God who created that could not in his omnipotence give us a greater gift than the Holy Eucharist. And he could not in his wisdom think of a greater gift than the Holy Eucharist. That's what we receive at this communion rail. It should tell us of the immense love of God for us, that there is nothing greater than he can give in his omnipotence, in his wisdom, in his love, Nothing greater than that he could give. Should we just run out after that? Can't we spend a few minutes thanking him for his goodness? That is the most important time of your spiritual life is the reception of Holy Communion. The most important time of your spiritual life. And it is Holy Communion that sustains you the most in the state of sanctifying grace. The profanation of Sunday is a direct attack upon God and often provokes his anger and his vengeance. If you're looking for the blessings of God, keep his Sunday holy. Our Blessed Lady at La Salette said, with tears in her eyes to the shepherds, that blasphemy and profanation of Sunday, quote, are the two things that lend weight to the arm of my Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.